Hello, today is April 9th, 2014. We're meeting today with Mr. Leonard Alt at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Leonard, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born October 5th, 1922, in Lowell, Indiana. I was, uh, my childhood was spent in Calumet City, Illinois. I have uh, three siblings, uh, two sisters who are twin sisters, who are young, four years younger than I, and a brother, Wayne, who is a couple years older than I. And he lives in Wisconsin, my sisters live in Indiana and uh, North Carolina. Um, Everyone's still alive, huh? They're all, all, all four of us are still alive. I'll be darned. Yeah. In fact, uh, my brother and sister-in-law just celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary in February. And of course, Elizabeth and I ce ce celebrated ours in uh, March. Um, I went to secondary school in uh, Kedema City, Illinois. Uh, Elizabeth and I met on a hayride in a church youth group in Hamlin, Indiana, when uh, she was a freshman in high school and I was a sophomore. Yeah. And we've been holding hands ever since. I'll be darned. Yeah. Um, I uh, went to school at, at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago as a cooperative student for two and a half years. And then the war came along. And uh, at that time, I enlisted in the Army. Let, let me back up. I just okay. a couple of questions before we get, get into your military career. Uh, one question I always like to ask your generation is, what memories do you have and, and how was your uh, family if they were affected by the Great Depression? Well, uh, fortunately my dad never, my dad always had a job. He worked on the railroad and he had to take a couple of demotions during the Depression. And, uh, and there was some concern at one time that they might lose their home. But uh, he was able to, to save it through negotiating with his life insurance, I think. And, Things like that. So uh, that was never a real strong strain for us. Uh, I knew that we were poor, um, but we always had uh, plenty to eat and uh, a good, clean place to stay. My mother and dad were very devoted parents, uh, and uh, I'm so pleased that I was brought up in a Christian background. And. Uh, Frankly, church was a was a focal point in our lives, and of course, that's where I met Elizabeth. Um, as a child, I had buddies, and we did some ordinary things, but uh, never got into serious trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although Dad saw to that, <laughs> and, and uh, he was a great believer in corporal punishment, yeah. which <laughs> I used to think as a child, maybe I'm old enough not to be spanked anymore, and then I found out I wasn't. <laughs> uh, but uh, I always looked at uh, my, my brother as the brains in the family. He was a very bright guy. And my sisters came along behind me, and they were very talented. And I was in the middle, and uh, sometimes felt as though uh, um, I suffered by comparison. But uh, I, we are still very close, brothers yeah. and sisters, and uh, have enjoyed each each other all these years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So then, uh, what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1940. 1940, and then we're going. You went off to the uh, uh, to college then. Yeah, I went on to school right immediately after that. Okay. To, uh, what were you setting out to study? Did you have an interest at that point? Or? Yeah, I started out in studying mechanical engineering. Uh -huh. Uh, I was a, a cooperative student uh, where we went to school for a semester and then we would work for a semester. And I worked for a company in, in Hammond, Indiana while I was in school. And uh, that was the way I could get through school. Yeah, right. My parents had, I had an agreement with my parents that they would give me room and board as long as I brought my report card home. <laughs> and uh, so I commuted from Academy City into Chicago every day on the bus to go to school. Wow, wow. And do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, it was a Sunday evening uh, after 
and we would go on to a Sunday evening church service, Elizabeth and I, and afterwards the young people would get together in various people's homes, and we went to this one home, the Abbott family, as I recall, and when we got there, she, she, Mrs. Abbott was crying, and uh, we, of course, wanted to know what, what the problem was, and uh, they told us that Pearl Harbor had been uh, attacked, and I really didn't think it was that big a deal at the, at the moment, you know. But um, that was my first un my first knowledge of what had happened. And then what uh, talk walk us through uh, what transpired from that point until you enlisted? I mean, how much l longer after that, or what what I'm happened during sure. that I was time? In, we were in high school. Oh, you're still, still in high, high school. school? Yeah, as I recall, I'm not sure. But anyway, I had two. Then I went on as soon as I graduated from high school. I went on to college for okay. two and a half years. Yeah. Um, and in the intervening time, I enlisted in the Army with the understanding that I would uh, continue in school under the, Amer in the uh, Army Specialized Training Program. Okay. And I did that to finish out a semester. And uh, we had sort of an ROTC environment uh -huh. uh, in, in school. And then at the end of the semester is when I was called up to active duty. Now, why did you choose the Army over the other branches? For a very silly thing. I kind of liked the Navy, but I thought that they wouldn't take me because of my eyesight, which I found out later was not the case at all. <laughs> I was warm and they would have taken me. <laughs> but uh, um, I can't say that I had any, particularly lo any particular logic in, in joining okay. the Army. Okay. Okay. Other than knowing that I was going to have to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you get called up. Uh, you take off then, uh, once you were called up, how long before you were uh, sent off to, to boot camp or uh, well, basic training? Well, uh, it was a very short time from the time I was called up. Uh, of course, I, I'd finished my semester in school, and I think at that time I realized I was going to be called into active duty. So uh, I think I had orders to then report for, for active duty. And uh, I reported at Camp Kellogg in Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, that's where I started my military career. Okay. Now, w did you go through a basic training or because you, uh, the previous oh, year? Yeah. Did, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. went through basic training at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. And, uh, and, and that was a cavalry post at the yeah, time. Right. So it still had a strong cavalry influence. In fact, they, they had some horses, but they, they used them primarily for playing polo on Sunday. <laughs> but uh, that's where I got my, my, I had my uh, basic training. And how was that transition going from civilian life into military life, or had uh, the college that ROTC program kind of prepared you for? Uh... Well, I can remember the first night at Camp, Camp Kellogg. Um, we uh, went to into the mess hall for for dinner, and the first indignation I had was the fact we had to stand up to eat, and. Uh, and then I asked for milk, and I got laughed down for that because all they had was coffee, and I wasn't a coffee drinker. And so uh, that was sort of an indignity. And the thing I remember about that on the, that evening, then we uh, were sitting out on the steps of the barracks, still in our civilian clothes, and uh, uh, a bunch of GIs came marching by, and we, they looked like veterans to me. <laughs> but um, they'd probably been there a month. But I thought, uh, what an indignity. These guys are having to go out at night you know, <laughs> and, uh, and train. Why, why couldn't they get their training during the day? And I thought, this is just not the kind of environment I was looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a good number of rude awakenings, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Made it through uh, basic then, and then yeah. uh, where'd you go from there? Uh, finished basic, and at the end of basic, we had to take some written testing to prove our capability to go on the, through the Army Specialized Training mm -hmm. Program. So I took the, the, the exams and I passed those and was assigned then to go to the University of Missouri. So we went from Kansas to Missouri by truck and uh, that's where I, I spent the next six months in school back to studying engineering again at the University of Missouri with a whole bunch of other guys. So I, from what I understand, that program then was discontinued. Uh, they, I think they realized that they were, there was going to be a shortage of men and they discontinued yeah. the... That was in March of 44. And 
we were anticipating, we were finishing a semester right around the 1st of April. And uh, I was anticipating getting a furlough. And we were planning then to get married while we were oh, wow. on furlough. But uh, all furloughs were canceled. And uh, so on the 24th of March, I had a pass to go to St. Louis. And I and some other guys got on the highway and uh, uh, hitchhiked to St. Louis. And effectively, I went AWOL from there to go to Chicago and then to Hammond where to, to be with Elizabeth. And our plan at that time was to get our marriage license. We'd had our blood tests and we were going to get our marriage license and then see what happened. You know. But on the way down to getting our county seat to get our marriage license, we decided, well, let's go ahead and get married. Oh, wow. So we got married on the 25th of March, 1944. And uh, the 26th, we got on a train and headed back to St. Louis and a bus to, to uh, Columbia, Missouri, so I could stand readily on the next morning. And you made it? I made it. We made it. <laughs> Elizabeth and I checked into the Tiger Hotel at about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And uh, I went to Stanford Reveille and they found out that all class, we were about due to have our final exam, so I thought we were, I was going to, but they canceled those and said we were on our way out and we were strict, restricted to quarters. And so I worked it out with my buddies I, that they'd call me if there was anything happening and I went back to the hotel. <laughs> and uh, then on April 1st, April Fool's Day, we shipped out. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> Now, when you when you guys got married, was it uh, justice of the peace, or did you have time to put together a ceremony? Or uh... well, yeah, our, we were married in our pastor's home, and I think that's what they had planned all along. But uh, we were married in our pastor's home, and uh, our families, my mother and dad, were there, and her two aunts were there, and then she had a friend who was standing up for her, and I had a buddy who was in the Navy in Chicago, and I called him, and he came and stood up with me, uh -huh. and our pastor married us. And then that evening, the, uh, the gals were, had planned a surprise party for Elizabeth, a surprise shower. So after the wedding, we went and surprised her, a surprise the party, and, uh, and spent the night in her apartment and took off the next day to go back to Missouri. Oh, what a great story. <laughs> so now we're back to April Fools. You, you ship off. You had any idea where you guys were going? Or yeah, told we you went to Camp Robinson, Arkansas. I think that we knew where we were going at that time. And uh, to the 66th Infantry Division. Um, but the division was in transit at that time, trans uh, moving to uh, Camp Rupper, Arkansas, uh, Alabama. And uh, I was left behind then on a cleanup detail. There's a disadvantage to having your name begin to a with A in the Army because you're at the head of every roster. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was left behind for a week or so, and then I went on down to, to Camp, uh, Camp Rucker, uh, Alabama, where am I? Alabama. And uh, that, there we were there until we shipped out to go overseas. So at this point, uh, any education you guys had was all thrown out the window. You were just, yeah. you were just purely uh, uh, grunts now. Uh, foot soldiers. Exactly. In, in fact, I. My understanding was that the, the 66th Division had the highest educational level of any division in the Army because they filled it up with all these guys from ASDP. Uh -huh. And here I was, I was a, in effect a junior in my junior year in college when I went there. And there were a lot of guys just like me. Yeah. And you were just a private then? Uh, still? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was just a, no, I was a, yeah, I was still a private. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then we went through some pretty intense training during that summer. And uh, I'm not sure when I became a PFC, but someplace along the line. And from there, then we went to, we were shipped out to go overseas. And no furlough between that period to get home? Yeah, I had one furlough. One furlough, as I recall, before we went overseas. Uh, while I was in Al uh, Camp Rucker, Alabama, Elizabeth came down and and stayed with me for about a month. And she stayed in Enterprise, Alabama with a couple of dear old Southern ladies. Huh. And that was quite a time for her in itself. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> she uh, used to tell about how 
she would go to lunch at the local cafe and they, they would play the same song every day on the jukebox called A Sailor's Last Letter, which was very, <laughs> very <laughs> encouraging to her. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so uh, at the end of a lot of months, she, uh, she came on home. And, oh, that had to be a tough time. Uh, yeah, that was a tough time. time. Yeah, I mean, it's tough yeah. to be going overseas Yep. But to have uh, to have to leave behind a wife, uh, yep. oh boy, well, the uncertainty. I, I think it was tougher for her. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, where'd you guys uh, disembark from, or uh, embark we for? Went, uh, to, went to um, was it Camp Kilmer, New Jersey? Yeah, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. We were there at Camp Shanks. We came into one, mm. one going, one coming. Actually, oh, okay. which is which. And when we got there, we were there for just a short time. And they shipped a bunch of us up to uh, West Point to qualify on small arms where we hadn't previously qualified. And they found in my records that I hadn't qualified on the Colt 45 pistol, which is the Army's worst weapon. And uh, we got up there and we were on the firing range. And of course, we didn't give a hoot whether we qualified or not. And finally, the sergeant in charge says, well, if you can't hit them, throw it at them. You're not qualified. <laughs> so we were qualified. <laughs> and uh, well, we shipped out then, I won't recall just what day, but it was, we were on, we were on the, the high seas with the Thanksgiving time. I remember that. Well, well that begs the question. Here's a, a Midwest uh, boy going to sea. Did you get your sea legs or how oh. was that crossing? I was seasick the whole time. <sighs> Of course, we went the northern route. This is November, and uh, interestingly, though, I this, this ship had a ship store where you could buy stuff, and one thing they bought of all thing uh, they had of all things was uh, uh, ripe olives in bottle, bottle ripe in brine, and I found that that brine that the ripe olives were in, I don't know why, settled my stomach, so hmm. I drank that stuff <laughs> on the way over. But uh, we were on the we were on uh, the ship for seven or eight days, and we had one submarine scare. Now, were you solo or were you in a convoy? We we're in a convoy. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, as I remember, there was a baby uh, flat top on one side of us, and uh, but uh, yeah, there was a convoy of a whole bunch of ships, and, there was, and we we went on then to uh, Southampton, England, where we disembarked. And uh, we're there for a few weeks before we went on, on across. Now, was that uh, was that prior to D Day, or had D Day already? Oh, D Day had already been. So already. D Day Day was uh, in June, June. Uh -huh. and we went in November. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, but on the way over, a ship, one of the ships in the convoy, was torpedoed in the channel, and uh, nine over nine hundred guys from my division lost their lives. Oh. Uh, when that ship went down, so uh, our division was kind of screwed up at that point, you know. So uh, I remember them telling us when we landed, I was in a, on an LST, and we landed on the beach, and that's when I found out about the, that ship being torpedoed. Did you have buddies on that ship? And yeah, uh -huh. I had uh, one fellow I knew, a fellow by the name of Tom, and I had understood that he had died in that uh, occurrence. And uh, later after the war, when I was back in school, they, uh, I heard a fellow holler, hey all, and I turned around, here was Tom. Really? Yeah. Huh. And uh, so we had a good good reunion. He had been on the ship, and he had uh, been uh, exposed to the point where he ended up with pneumonia. And uh, he was shipped back to the States, so he never came on into, into, into France. Mm. Uh, that, he was the only one I knew that was yeah, there. That yeah. was it, there was a, I was in the 263rd Regiment and I was the 264th. Okay, so you landed in, in France. Did you land there? Where'd you guys land in, in France? Uh, Cherbourg. Cherbourg? Was, mm -hmm. was there still quite a bit of damage from uh, uh, the Yeah, fighting? there was some that I noticed. I, the, the one, one thing that's vivid to me was a German rifle lying in, in a ditch, and uh, we all stood and looked at it and didn't want to touch it for fear it was booby-trapped. Mm -hmm. But the, that was my strongest recollection. 
But uh, they, the beach was pretty well cleaned up, as I recollect, at that time. There were ships in the, in the water that had been sunk, and you know, boat, boats. But uh, we landed on a pretty clean area. And I was in an anti-tank company, so we had vehicles, a lot of vehicles, and that's why I was on an LST. Mm, okay, okay. The LST is the flat-bottom boat that yeah, go right up to the Yeah, it has a ramp on the front. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you, I suppose you, you you collected there, and then take your story there once you guys have. Uh... Well, my, my understanding was that we were due to go up to the Battle of the Bulge because mm. that was, had just started at that yeah, time. Yeah, right. And uh, but because we we had lost so many men and the things were kind of in a turmoil, we then replaced a division. Uh, I don't recall it was the 84th, if, if I'm not incorrect, mm -hmm. uh, that it had encompassed the Cherbourg Peninsula, and they had uh, several tens of thousands of Germans uh, tied up there. Oh, okay. And so we replaced that division uh, at that point, and that's where we spent the rest of the war, uh, in kind of a trench warfare kind of thing. Right, right. With patrols and that sort of stuff. And, uh, I think the G I think the logic at that point, as far as the Americans are concerned, is, you know, don't don't try to take the Germans because it would be too costly. And if we did take them, they'd all be POWs, and we'd have to take care of them. So just let them be. Okay. So it was kind of a, it's kind of a phony war in a way, although uh, we paid for it in other ways like mud, and and we were, we spent the winter there then. I wasn't a, I wasn't inside a building I don't think from from the, that time until springtime. Yeah, talk a little bit about. I, I mean, that's one thing I, I'm always amazed when I hear these stories is uh, you guys are out in the elements. Yeah. Uh, you probably weren't eating all that well. Probably weren't sleeping all that well. Uh, the weather hygiene wasn't probably so good. I mean, I mean, I would think any one of those things could take a man down. But you had all those coupled with the umbrella of war. How do you think you made it well, through that? Surprisingly. Time? I don't recall any of us having colds or anything like that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we acclimatized to the weather. It seemed pretty well. We learned how to, to sneak under trucks to sleep and what, what you weren't supposed to do. Uh, what you did is take the distributor rotor out of the truck so no one can drive it away while you're sleeping under it. And th th that sort of thing. You know, so we acclimatized pretty well to it. The, the worst part of it was the mud. Were you were you properly outfitted? Uh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we had we had overcoats and and uh, we were we were properly clothed. Yeah. So uh, I don't recall it being a particularly cold winter. It was just miserable. You know. Because I know well, in the Battle of the Bulge, I, I think it was the coldest winter yeah. in, in Europe uh, in the last yeah. previous fifty years or something. Yeah, so and that's amazing to me because it wasn't. You know, Europe is not all that big geographically, yeah. and it's amazing to me because where we were, I think we probably were close, well, we were close to the coast, coast. and we had the coastal influence there. But, uh, so your, your primary objective was just to keep those Germans contained? Yeah, and, and make sure they behaved themselves. And There was a, a good deal of horsing around that way. They'd come in, sneak in behind our lines and, and blow up. Uh, I remember one time they blew up the church steeple behind us because the artillery was using it as a observation posts and the Germans knew it and uh, we were using a um, what had been a granary out in front of us as an observation post and the guys would go out there before daylight spend the day there watching to see what the Germans were doing and come back at night so there'd be nobody out there during the day but they had uh, we had a, uh, a sound powered phones out from there out, out to work back to where we were and one night, one of the fellows got on the phone to call. They, they, we would call back and forth to make sure everything was okay. And uh, it was like a big party line. And uh, <laughs> the guy got on and we, he'd whistle. I, don't, I think he'd whistle three times or something like that. And somebody came on the line and says, Number, please. The, Ger the Germans were occupying the granary during the night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so we had we had company that way. Wow. Was uh, was there skirmishes? Was there any fighting, or were the Germans kind of the same in the Not, same boat? Just kind yeah, of yeah. Well, we had mortar fire. We had 
artillery fire. Uh, there was no direct contact, as I recall, uh, with them where we were hand to hand or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we were we were an anti-tank company, but we did not bring up our anti-tank guns. We had 57 millimeter anti-tank guns, and we didn't bring them up. We we were just uh, more like a cavalry outfit, cavalry being recon. And, and, uh, so you guys finished out the war there. You never moved east as the war? No. Yeah. Uh, we didn't move east until the end of the war. Um, the Germans in our sector didn't give up until uh, two days after VE Day. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. interesting. And uh, we all thought we were going to, well, we were told we were going to go in and get them. And uh, we thought we were all going to get killed, you know, just because of the circumstance. But they gave up then, and then we went in. It was a minefield. It turned out there was a German minefield in front of us. So if we'd ever tried to cross it. But anyway, we went into to, uh, a coastal town of Le Boule, France, then, where the Germans were. And that's where they, the Germans surrendered at that point to us. And... Uh, were taken back to POW camps, I presume. And uh, we stayed there just a few days. We were, the first night we were there, we were billeted in a hotel. It's the first time we'd been indoors. But the second day, the free French came in to liberate the town. And they took, <laughs> over, the to they took over the hotel, so we had to vacate and go back to an apple orchard outside of town. <laughs> and. Uh, and then from there we went uh, by convoy to Coblenz, Germany. And uh, that's when we re really saw the effects of the war. Oh, right. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Well, we saw these emaciated people that were coming and going from where to where we didn't know, but were on the road, all begging for food. And uh, they were headed home to whatever that was left of their homes from wherever they'd been. We presume some of them had come out of concentra concentration camps or whatever. And at that time, we really didn't know about this this uh, in, the business with the Jews and how mm -hmm. they had. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether they were some some of those were them or not, we don't. I don't know. But we tried to do what we could for them. You know, whenever we'd stop, we'd stop every couple hours, and uh, they they just descend on us, and we'd give them whatever we could. So that was really the first inkling I had of how how decimating that war was. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Um, but we went on to Koblenz and uh, were just there for a few days and uh, then left. And incidentally, the German people there were just nicest people. Really? Yeah, but we weren't supposed to fraternize with them. But they were really nice. And uh, this one fellow had owned a dairy that was pretty well bombed out, but the boiler was still intact. And I don't know whether he had an agreement with the government or what, but he had that boiler operating and creating hot water so we could take showers. He had kind of a... Sh when, when was the last time you'd taken a nice oh, hot shower oh, prior said, to that? I don't recall. Uh, I, I, the only time I remember, remember I'm sure I had others, yeah. but the only time I remember, the we, they pulled us back to an area where uh, the Army engineers had set up a shower facility and it was in a semi-truck truck trailer. And they had shower heads on both sides, on the inside, and buckboards, and you'd go in there, and you stripped down, gave them all your clothes, and uh, went in and hung up your helmet and uh, your shoes on a hook above the shower head. They gave a minute of warm water and a minute to soap yourself and a minute of water to rinse. And, and oh yeah, they gave you a towel too. So you took those and went into another tent outside the tra trailer, dried off, and then you went through a line to get reissued clothes. And uh, of course, we were wearing uh, wool, o wool ODs, and uh, they were doing laundering those, so they shrank. So we soon learned to give two or three sizes higher, so we get something that would fit, and uh, they would. That, we got clean clothes on. And that's, that's that's the only time I recall having a. A, uh, a shower wow. facility. Wow. Other than that, we just had to take care of that ourselves. Huh. Took a bath in our helmets or whatever. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, 
So I, I assume you guys were heading east to be part of the occupation forces. Yeah, there. but then they shipped us back to Marseille, France, our whole division. And there were about two or three huge, tense cities there. And they put us to work um, processing troops that were coming out of Europe through Marseille. Okay. And uh, um, they made our company into an MP company. And uh, I had been working in the supply, with the supply room. And uh, our supply sergeant got in trouble selling GI goods to the to the Senegalese troops who were billeted next to us. And so I got tapped on the shoulder to be supply sergeant, except I was uh, still a PFC. <laughs> and they weren't passing out promotions. So I spent that summer then uh, on that job. And uh, during that time we had to turn in all of our stuff, uh, weapons and so forth. Well, now the uh, the war was still raging in the Pacific. Was there any worry about you guys getting transferred? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, the troops that were coming through were really concerned about that. And that's where they were headed. They were oh coming. wow! And uh, you know, to kind of digress a minute, but my understanding is that one of the reasons Harry Truman did what he did as far as the bomb is concerned is because they were concerned about our GIs as well, and that they're going to have a mutiny on their hands. Hmm. I don't know if that's true or yeah. not, but that was the story I heard. Fair enough, assess. Yeah, because these guys had done their job and right. now they're going to have to do another one. But, uh, so we processed all those people through, and there were just acres and acres and acres of trucks and tanks and artillery pieces and so forth. I don't know whatever happened to that stuff that wow. was turned in. Um, I can remember one incident. We had uh, field ranges uh, for cooking. And uh, we had lost one, one way or another. And uh, the, the, supplies, the previous supply sergeant had not uh, taken advantage of uh, what they, writing off combat loss. So we were still had that on the books. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do about that. So another guy and I went to the area where we knew they had t p turned in field ranges. And so we picked up a field range and took it back. And the next day took it back again and turned it in again. <laughs> And, and then another time I had, we had, I had all of the small arms weapons in this, the supply tent. And they were supposed to be turned in, but they were supposed to be cleaned. So I reissued them all to the guys to clean them and turn them back in again. Well, it came the morning I had to take from them. I was short one pistol. Uh -oh. And I didn't know what to do. So we went ahead and I just, I turned it in anyway on paper and got by with it. And when I came back to the to the supply tent, there was that pistol lying on my cot. So now what do I do with it? <laughs> so the latrine was close by. <laughs> so I took care of that. <laughs> uh, so, mm. But everything came out even. Yeah. During this time, uh, did you ever get a chance uh, for furloughs to go into, say, Paris oh, yeah. or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I took uh, advantage of every furlough I could get. Yeah. Uh, while I was there at, uh, in Saint Nazaire, with, or in uh, uh, I forget the name of the camp, but anyway, while I was there, I went to the Riviera uh -huh. for a week, the French Riviera, and then uh, later, when I was stationed in Vienna, I went to uh, Lourdes, and I went to um, uh, Switzerland, and one other place I forget now. But yeah, I took advantage of every furlough I could get. Well, you know, uh, like many of your generation, probably growing up, you didn't travel too far away from home. So for a Midwest boy, that must have been a fascinating oh, yeah, time to, yeah. to see what you saw. Yeah. yeah. Well, particularly Switzerland. Uh, of course, Switzerland had not been ravaged by the war. Yeah. And uh, they treated us very nicely. And it was in the winter time, And uh, we went to a ski resort and uh, traveled around several places. And a young lady was our tour guide, I recall. And uh, at one point, I was trying to, we, we were being taught to ski, and I fell and really racked up my ankle. And we went back to the hotel, and I remember lying in bed, and a knock came on the door, and this 
matronly woman came in and she wanted to see my ankle. You know, I was, I was dressed in my underwear, under you know, and I, so I was a little bashful about it. She, said, oh come on, I have sons of my own. <laughs> <laughs> I stuck my leg out and let her look at my ankle. She was the gal who ran the hotel. <laughs> so, but uh, that was a, that was a good tour. Wow. wow. And, uh, when I went to Lourdes, where the shrine of Saint Bernadette is, uh, another fellow and I. Uh, I guess we took a bus. We wanted to go to Spain. And the Lord's is, you know, it's right up in the Pyrenees Mountains. So we took this bus and went up to a little town and, uh, and got to hold of a farmer who rented us a couple of little burrows. And, he, and I think he went with us. But anyway, we went up into the mountains and uh, we came to the border and there was a border marker there. And it was a, just nobody around or anything. So we thought we'd just go on across. So we did, and we no sooner came across, and here came a couple of, of uh, Spanish soldiers with their weapons and let us know that we didn't belong there. But I can say I've been in Spain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you had mentioned uh, when you were stationed in Vienna, did you go then, were you transferred then uh, from uh, Marseille to Vienna then, or? Yeah, from Marseille we uh, went to, uh, Salzburg and was there just a short time and then went from there to Vienna and Vienna was a four-power city like, uh, like right. uh, Ber Berlin so that was kind of a tense situation there we're about 60 miles inside the Russian territory uh -huh. and uh, those poor people I mean the Russians had raped them literally in every other way it was they were they were really destitute uh -huh. and uh, so they were extremely friendly to us, and you know, because we did everything we could to help them. But uh, the Russians had uh, done a number on on Vienna, even after the Viennese tried to surrender. They had they had uh, with artillery done a lot of damage to the city. At least this is what we were told. So uh, there was no love for them. Did, did you have any interaction with the Russians at all? Uh, yeah. Um, at one point, my roommate. A fellow named Howard had a girlfriend, and she lived outside of Vienna in in the Russian territory. And he wanted to go visit her on Sunday afternoon, so he asked me to go along, I guess. And so I said yes. And so we we checked out a jeep, and we headed out. We had it agreed that we, if we came to a to a checkpoint, we'd stop, and as soon as the Russians approached us, we'd just take off. So we did that at one checkpoint and got by with her. And came to the another checkpoint just outside of this little town of Barry, and there was a train coming across the railroad tracks, and there was a checkpoint there, so so we had to stop. And uh, so one of the Russians got into the jeep with us, and we were, I don't know how we were instructed as far as the language is concerned, but we were taken to uh, their headquarters in Barry. So I told Howard, I said, well, I'll stay in the jeep, and you go and see what's going on. So he went in, and pretty soon he came out with his GI and the GI and a submachine gun. And we have to go back to Vienna. And uh, so this GI climbed in the back end, back seat, and we took off. And Howard and I were work, both work, carrying shoulder pist pistols and shoulder holsters. So we decided we'd take him to the American sector and we'd dump him. <laughs> but the trouble was, in order to get past, get into Vienna, you had to go past the Russian headquarters. And in front of the Russian headquarters is a big picture of Stalin and a big picture of uh, for another Russian, as I recall. And so we just drew, nonchalantly drove by, and we <laughs> heard this guy put around in his chamber. So we thought we'd better stop. And we went back in, and uh, there was a, uh, we sat in the hall for a long time, I recall, on a bench. And finally they had us come in to, I suppose this was the officer of the day. And he was sitting there behind a desk eating soup. And uh, he couldn't speak English, so they had a, a, uh, a woman from, an Austrian woman there to, to translate. And she wasn't very good. And uh, Howard's last name was a was Polish name, and it was a mile long. <laughs> so I saw, she, tr she translated it, or she wrote it down. And when I saw how she wrote it, it was pretty obvious that it you know, wasn't, wasn't Howard. And then she passed it on to this guy. No, and then she translated into into the Russian. And I thought, well, by the time it gets to him, 
you know, it's not going to make sense at all. <laughs> so then they asked me my name, and I ran my first and second name together, and then the same thing happened. And uh, so we got back to uh, to our where we were billeted in our headquarters. We went in and saw the company commander and confessed to him what had happened. He said, well, let's just wait and see. So the next day, sure enough, a, a query came down, did he have these two men in his outfit? And, and he wrote back, wrote back, no, he didn't have one by that name. <laughs> so he got off by that. So that was my contact with the Russians. And uh, we had a few others, like uh, we, uh, I didn't do this directly, but a couple of our guys stole, stole an American jeep from a Russian major and, and uh, stripped it clean for him. <laughs> <laughs> so there was no love lost there. Yeah, right. Would you have much interaction with the civilians, the local civilians? Oh yeah, yeah quite a bit. Yeah. But, uh, this is one thing that was really disturbing to me. I was married and I was bound and determined I was going to be true to my wife. But there was, I, it really disturbed me how some of our guys conducted themselves from that standpoint. Mm. So. Uh, uh, in fact, when we came home, I remember one of our fellows had gone to his priest to confess the, the, the uh, army priest, his chaplain, and the chaplain told me he had to confess to his priest at home. <laughs> he was not very happy about that. Oh. Yeah. So then how long, I, I'm assuming you were there till you built them up enough points to go home? Yeah, yeah. I was there the, all that winter, uh, fall and winter. And there until I came home the following was it April when the, I think it was April when I came home. April forty six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And talk a little bit about uh, communications. I mean, in today's age, we've got computers and cell phones and instant messaging. Talk about your communications back home and what options you had in that regard. Well, that was that was probably one of the most difficult things. Uh, Elizabeth used to like we used to like to say we didn't. We, we were separated for a year and a half, and literally we were. Uh, I didn't hear her voice. Uh, I would get uh, 15, 20 letters at one time. And uh, I was very conscious of that, that from the stand, the other side of it, you know, what must have been going on from her point of view. In fact, when we had this incident in the channel and we lost so many of the guys, the word got back uh, somehow or another by the grapevine of what had happened. And uh, Elizabeth's aunts knew about that happening in our division. And Elizabeth knew from another source, and they weren't telling each other. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, so uh, that was really a difficult, that was really difficult. And, and it was probably difficult from your end because with mail being censored, you yeah. couldn't. Uh, you, you couldn't. Uh -uh. You, you, well, after a while, I got so I loosened up on that. And uh, in fact, Elizabeth has all those letters, and oh, wow. some of them are kind of mushy. But yeah, uh, but yeah you, you were always conscious of the, the fact that your platoon uh, lieutenant was re reading your mail. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, there was gaps. So how long would it take? You said that it's oftentimes a bunch would arrive at once. I mean, it would probably month, be... Sometimes I think it probably would be, you know, be a month before letters get. Wow. Yeah. Just depending on what... what these people went by ship, you know, by yeah. convoy. Yeah. And, uh, so there's, say, there's a whole month that, uh, yeah. of uncertainty, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. A month ago, he was okay, but was it? And I was very conscious of that. I just really bothered me that, you know, that, that what was happening from this, stand, this end, yeah. from that standpoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're, we're ahead now, and, and uh, you finally got enough points to come home. Tell, take your story from there. Well, we, I went from uh, Vienna to uh, Camp Philip Morris on the uh, coast of France. And we went by train. As I recall, it took a week. And we were in boxcars, and that was a filthy mess. The old lady by 40, or 8 by 40s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had the choice of either having straw in the car for a bedding or having a, a stove. You couldn't have both. Oh, and uh, so we had a stove. And uh, we slept on the floor. I had a, I had a brand new raincoat. And uh, by the time we got back to uh, 
France, but it was so dirty that I just threw it away. There's no way of cleaning it. Wow. So it was a miserable town. And of course, uh, the only way you could relieve yourself was when the train would stop, every, see all the guys jumping off and, and digging their little plate holes, and, and then the train would start up and guys running along, <laughs> pulling up their pants. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, I don't recall, we stopped one, no, there was another. I don't recall how we ate at that time. I guess we just had rations. Oh, we didn't have a mess kitchen or anything like that. We just must have had rations. But uh, at least we were headed home. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, boy. So, but that was that was a long ride. That was about seven, seven days, or about five days, as I recall. And uh, we'd sit for hours on the siding Sorry. where other trains would be coming through. And the railroads were in such bad shape that they, you know, they were very limited. But uh, we finally got to uh, Camp Philip Morris and, and we were there, I think, about a week or two waiting for a ship. And uh, I remember at that time, I had, a, I had a German Luger that I'd taken from a German. And uh, I had proper documentation. You had to get documentation that you know, how it was taken and so forth. And, and they, they would come through there when we were there at Camp Philip Morris. We were living in tents. And they would come through and uh, check all your stuff. You had to lay everything out. And uh, I had that Luger line there with the documentation. But this lieutenant and a couple of other guys came through and they took it. Oh. You, know, you can't have that. And I, of course, I wasn't about to jeopardize my positions and, right. but I it was a, a nice Luger ah. but uh, I'm sure that lieutenant has it in a drawer someplace in his <laughs> home if he's still alive <laughs> yeah. but uh, then every day we'd go and check the bulletin board to see if we were on the list and one day we I saw my name on the list on a, the SS Florence Nightingale I was like man that sounds like a hospital ship we're going home in style <laughs> and it turned out to be an old tub this is to be its last journey, and, oh, oh, but uh, at least we were headed in the right direction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was the trip home any better than the oh, trip going there? Or you... uh, it was a little, I think it was a couple of days shorter because the going they, they, in the convoy we had to mm. zigzag, but uh, the food was terrible. We lived in hard-boiled eggs, and, and uh, the weather wasn't any better. <laughs> so those. Those trips over and back were not were not cruises. Right, right. We, we slept, I think, four or five high. And what what would you do to pass the time on both trips, uh, try both to, crossings? Uh, most of the time, try to sleep. You just really? rather yeah. nap and. Uh, frankly, there was uh, my recollection going over the ship was so crowded you couldn't even find a place to sit down on deck. You know? Wow! Wow! And, uh, and then whenever, well, that one time we had. Uh, that submarine scare and they made us all go below decks. That had, couldn't have been a good feeling, being below deck uh, with no, the submarine. No, and we were at the lowest deck. We could hear the propellers. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. so, a lot of guys, a lot of guys played poker, you know, shoot dice, and, which they weren't supposed to do, but they did anyway. Mm. One time, uh, one of the ship's officers came through and caught him doing that, and he collected all of the cards and the money that was on the deck and confiscated it for the Siemens Fund. <laughs> but it was, it was in, interminable. It was yeah. just, you know, both ways. Oh, boy. <coughs> Particularly coming home, it just seemed like it was never going to leave. And you arrived back into New Jersey again then? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I went from there to uh, to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and that's where I was separated from the Army. And that is the only time I saw the Army move. You know, you, the Army's favorite saying is hurry up and wait. But when we got to Camp McCoy, it just seems like I couldn't catch up because things were happening so fast. Mm, wow. But they got us out of there in a hurry. Now, how far away is that from, from home then? Well, it's just a short, it's a short train ride. Oh, okay. Camp McCoy, I don't recall. Just exactly where Camp McCoy is. It's on the west side of of uh, Wisconsin, the southwest side of Wisconsin. 
So it was a short ride from there to Chicago. Were you able to get word home that you were coming? Or yeah, yeah, okay. Elizabeth knew I was coming. Yeah, in fact, the first night I was, when we got in New Jersey, we were allowed to call home. Oh, okay. And uh, we were asked to hold our phone calls to three minutes or something like that. Elizabeth and I talked for half an hour. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And the next uh, night, and, and incidentally, the re connections were terrible back in those days. Yeah. The next night I called her, and we talked for a long time, too. And uh, both times I had, I sent the, as collect calls. Oh, jeez. Then I got home and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> i got to pay the piper now. And that phone bill came through and they charged us for three minutes both times. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But that was great to hear her voice. Oh, I'll bet. And uh, well, I can't imagine what the homecoming must have been like oh, when you yeah. finally, finally yeah. got home, what yeah. that was. Yeah. And Elizabeth then had arranged to take off work for a week or so, and we, we went up to Wisconsin and had our, had our honeymoon. Finally had a proper yeah. honeymoon, huh? And yeah. uh, just had a good time of getting reacquainted. Was it, uh, how was that transition? Was it hard to transition from military and everything you'd been through, now you're back in civilian life? Was that much? Yeah, it was difficult for me from the standpoint of... Uh, I just couldn't sit still. It just seemed like the, well, I remember when we were, on, we were on that little trip, we were sitting alongside the river there in a beautiful spot, and I just wanted to do something. You know, I just, I just couldn't sit still. And uh, so it took, took me a while to settle down. Um, and then I had a, a period where uh, I was, suffered from nightmares, and, yeah. you know, I was remembering things. And, uh, and incidentally, they were much worse in the nightmare. In the nightmare. Yeah. Huh. But I had a period where that would, that would happen quite frequently, and then it began to take off. But, Are they all but gone now, or do you oh, occasionally still? Once in a while, I'll yeah. have a crazy dream. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I started back to school, and immediately I got home in a short order. Now, how was that? I, I always understood, too, that with so many guys coming home that the college has filled up, it was hard to get in and... Uh, no, I didn't have any, as I recall, I didn't have a problem okay. getting in. Um, it was a private school, and so I was a little concerned about cost under the GI Bill. But uh, <coughs> I had enough, I, I, how was it? I had enough money overall, but you, I exceeded the time limit. But still, they paid for it. They paid for it as long as I had the money. Now, were you getting credit for those classes when you were in the, in the Some, training program? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, in fact, that was the first thing I did was to, I took my transcript from the University of Missouri and, and went in to see the, uh, the dean and we went through it. And he initialed everything that he gave me credit for. In fact, that was, that was good because when it came to graduation, well, we, we had to check our, get our, our credits checked and uh, he claimed that I'd, I had one class that I needed to take over again, except he had initialed that, so I showed him that. So, anyway, so I finished school in a couple of years. Oh, okay. And, and uh, once again, in mechanical engineering? Well, no, I switched to industrial engineering. Okay. Then, yeah. Okay. Because uh, with mechanical engineering, I had some classes that were strong, had strong requirements in math, and I had it was a long time since I'd had that. I, I needed to get through, so. Yeah, right, right, right. And uh, as it turned out, Elizabeth then was a pre was pregnant in our last semester. And uh, I graduated, well, I graduated in February. And uh, she had her first child in, Ju in July. Hmm. And what did you go on to do then uh, as a career? Well, I went to work for Republic Steel in Chicago in the Industrial Engineering Department. And... Uh, I was there for <coughs> three years, and uh, I guess I kind of decided that I was in a dead end situation. So I had the opportunity to go to work for a chemical company in Chicago. It was a small company, and uh, it seemed to have greater opportunity. I really liked the guy who was going to be my boss. And uh, so I went to work for them, but I only worked for them for three months, and we had a I had a real altercation with the plant manager and 
quit my job and over some really silly things. But um, the guy that I worked for, who was really the assistant plant manager, <laughs> I just quit my job and cleaned out my desk and left for home. <laughs> and uh, when I got home, Elizabeth said some less had called, that was the guy's name. And I was to call him back. She said, what's going on? So I called him back and, and uh, Les says, you can't quit your job. You've got a family. Get back in here. So I went back the next day, and he made it his job to find a job for me. And he had this friend in, in this little town in Illinois who worked for a large printing company. And they were looking for an engineer. And so said, he and I and his friend had lunch one day. Never, I've never taken my boss on a job interview before. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the substance, some substance of it is I took a job with this printing company in Illinois. And uh, so we moved to that little, little town and lived there for almost 30 years. Really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, after that, went to work for the company. And we had a bad strike situation there in Illinois. And things were just going from bad to worse. And then this company in Ohio romance me and so I went to work for them and uh, what, what, it, what it came out it turned out to be that I knew the people from Reader's Digest and they had recommended me to this company and so I went to, and that company was producing Reader's Digest so I went to work for them until it was the old McCall Corporation you know McCall okay. Magazine <laughs> and uh, worked there until we shut the doors on shut down our operation, 2,500 people out of work. So uh, I was 59 years old and I needed a job. So I got a hold of the folks I knew in, in Georgia, amongst many others, and I went down there and built a new plant for them in Georgia. And that's where I finished out my, my working career. So how many years all together were you, uh, uh, was your career combined? Oh goodness. From the age 65 to back to what? 20, 25 is really a good good 40 years of yeah uh, yeah yeah. I was only we were only in Ohio three years, and and then we were in Georgia. I forget maybe six years before I retired. But I just went down there to build a plant, but I stayed for six years. <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, you had your first child. Talk about uh, talk about a little bit about family now. Okay, we had a, our first child just to, uh, in July of '48 after just after I graduated from school, and then uh, I have a son who's just two years younger, and then we had quite a hiatus, and then our da third daughter, our child, our daughter, who lives with us now, uh, was born in. Honey, when was Donna born? I don't remember, but she's in her fifties right now, early fifties. So, so we have three children. Three children, and two daughters, and a son. And how many uh, grandchildren? We have two grandchildren. We're not a very prolific family. <laughs> Any greats? Yeah, we have four great grandchildren. Four greats. Yeah, they're the loveliest kids in the world. Yeah. That's yeah, great. They live in Wisconsin. In fact, they're due out, to, out here in a couple of weeks. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah very good. Oh, yeah. Well, we've been blessed with family. Uh, every, our kids get along with each other and they're living with each other with us. Grandchildren, great grandchildren. Yeah. So we have a great family. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Through the years, did you uh, ever keep in touch with anybody you served with, or was there any sort of reunions? Of, yeah, uh, uh, no, never a reunion. I kept in touch with three or four guys for quite a, quite some time by. Christmas, you know, Christmas cards, but eventually, it gradually, that kind of dropped yeah. off, and I've not, I've not kept in touch with any of them. Yeah. And, and, it, and, and along those lines, too, uh, through the years, did you ever have a chance to go back to Europe and kind of retrace your steps at all? No, I've been to Europe a few times, but never, never to do that. Uh, Scandinavia, and uh, then I had some business trips. But Elizabeth and I, and our youngest daughter, went to scan to. Sweden. We had a Swedish exchange student lived with us for a year. Oh, right, yeah. So we went back and visited her at one point. Yeah. But no, I've never retraced my steps. Uh, I'd like to. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be fun to see 
health, you know, right. rebuilding particularly. Well, Leonard, as we start to um, wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't talk about or ask you about that you wanted to talk about or any other stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been sitting here talking so that ideally we, we cover your story or do you think we've done a pretty good job in that I regard? I think we've done a pretty good job. I, the only thing I'd say is that when I went in the Army, I, I felt that this was taking years off my life. You know, and uh, I don't know that I was very strongly motivated uh, patriotically, other than I was just doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah. But I, I just had the strong feeling, uh, it's just taking years off my life. I was in school, and that's been interrupted, and our relationship has been interrupted and so forth. But you know, as I look back on it, those are probably the most formative years of my life. Well, you, you, you kind of beat me to my, my last question I always like to ask with these, with these interviews is how that period of time affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life, or was just simply a chapter in your life? Well, I think it was very maturing, you know, yeah. obviously. And, uh, and gave me a you know, considerably different perspective on, on things. But um, um, it, it was a very strong experience. Yeah, right. And the only other thing is that you know, when we went into the war, we were fighting Germany and we were fighting Japan. You know, and that was pretty impersonal. Um, I knew we had to do it, but uh, and I'm, so I never had any qualms about going in from that standpoint, but you know, when I was in Europe and saw the suffering and the devastation that was you know, caused by the war, it, it made a whole new, gave me a whole new perspective of why I was there. Wow. It was not Germany and Japan, it was these people that needed to come and help. And, yeah, uh, right. And, uh, so that was, that was a real revelation, and particularly after the war, and so the, the depri deprivation of these people and the you know, the skeletons walking around and so forth, and uh, the stories that we heard, and then the, all this about the, the Jewish, the Holocaust. We, of course, that was not, we didn't know about that yeah, until right. after the yeah, war. Right. And uh, so that was the reason for fighting, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. That wasn't that we were fighting Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting Japan was for, we were fighting for those people. Right. Wow. And, uh, So it's obviously a very uh, meaningful point in yeah. the time of my life. Right, right, right. Well, I want to thank you very much for sitting down to tell your story today, but uh, just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you.